website for the actual guidance for commercial office space, as well as a summary of the, of the steps that businesses need to take. There's a reopen CT badge that you can download to certify that you've met the requirements. Finally, all businesses should be posting clear signage at their place of business that not only indicates the rules for employees and customers, uh, but also that any violations should be reported to the state's info line, which is 211. So employees, customers, and owners themselves should be encouraged to call that number if they find any potential violations of these rules. Went through a lot of stuff, a lot of information. Happy to summarize this as we go through it, hit on certain points, wanted to sort of give you the big picture. And with that, I'd like to introduce Aisha Woods. Aisha is the executive director of the city's city plan department. She's also an architect by profession. And Aisha, I'd like to turn it over to you to sort of offer your perspective, both your professional perspective and your administrative perspective when you've taken a look at the rules Perhaps you can highlight rules that you think businesses should be focused on and or the kind of considerations businesses should bring to trying to adapt and renovate their office space to accommodate their existing tenants and make their spaces as attractive to potential new tenants. So Aisha. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Um, and um, you certainly um, covered a lot of specifics about the guidelines in your introduction. Um, I'm just, so I'm gonna speak um, with, on a few matters with um, some perspective from a design point of view, but also um, in a broader interest in the way we work and how we can support um, a healthy, sustainable and equitable workplace going forward. So I think, um, you know, part of the overarching theme of this um, set of webinars is, you know, come, how can we come back better? Um, so some of the things I'm interested in are how can a workplace be conducive to the healing also that's necessary coming out of this pandemic. Um, so Steve had noted some of the um, the reopen guidance and it's based on um, safety first clear guidance um, a science and data driven approach um, relying on a prepared health infrastructure um, and also promoting choice and reopening and dynamic responsiveness so our conditions may be changing as we go along um, i'll focus on the specific CT guidance in a minute, but I wanted to also point out that there's many resources, many other available resources and interesting research um, on the workplace emerging from um, around the world. We're all in this together. So many, many people are, um, and professionals are um, looking at the same issues. Um, so some of the sources that <clears throat> I've looked at are um, from real estate leaders, such as um, Jones Lang LaSalle, and nonprofit research institutions such as um, the Healthy Building Center at the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health, um, International Well Building Institute, the, um, the United States Green Building Council and the AIA, as well as um, many architects have also published um, ideas and guidance and um, we can provide some links um, to these a little bit later. Um, so I just wanted to step back for a moment and take a planner perspective and ask how can we come back better. Um, the overarching goals again are to prevent transmission and maintain business continuity, um, but can we do it in a more healthy, sustainable and equitable way? Um, so just some, um, you know, some things I've learned in, in a brief review of the literature um, include, uh, you know, don't rush, really plan. Um, if remote working is working, um, enable that work mode until you have clear plans and protocols for coming back, including um, a way to communicate and, <clears throat> and do some, uh, you know, workplace changes to improve safety prior to people coming back. So it's a great time to take care of some deferred maintenance, you know, if that's needed. Um, so plan to come back better. Um, 
remote working might be working well for now, but in the long term, we're social creatures. And I just, um, I wanted to just uh, point to um, some research that Dr. Joy Hirsch, who's a um, world-renowned neuroscientist and runs the Brain Lab at Yale School of Medicine, um, some of her work, she's found through her experiments that live dynamic social interactions and face-to-face -face, um, with direct eye contact stimulate um, very specific parts of the brain that are different than social interactions on screen. So in the long term, we will need live social interaction um, for our mental health. So, um, you know, it's in, that's a health imperative to return to work also. Um, plan for change and flexibility. Um, a long-term flexibility should be considered. So um, the report by Jones Lang LaSalle also suggests 60% of office workers surveyed, and this was late April, intend to continue to work partly off-site. Um, also plan for changes in office space allocation. Um, the same report notes that 70% of office space was open plan in the first quarter of 2020. So this is um, following a long trend of going to more open office space with much more much smaller space allocations per person, around 70 square uh, feet per person in a benching desk. Um, <clears throat> this trend is going to quickly go back up to larger spaces per worker. Um, back to more like 120 to 150 square feet allocated per employee. Um, and then the return of the cube, right? The return of partitions to um, prevent transmission. Um, at the same time, the amount of space dedicated to informal gathering and shared amenities will be reduced or reconfigured. Um, and the motivation for the shared space trend has been um, sort of findings that creativity and innovation occur in informal group encounters and informal collaboration. Um, so we all know about, you know, the tree houses and sort of romper rooms on the Google campuses. These things may be going away. Um, but it's still really important to figure out how to facilitate that kind of collaboration in space. Um, finally, um, you know, I have a plan to shut down smoothly and quickly, you know, should we have another, um, you know, another spike at some point, uh, make sure employees are supported and have technology at home. And um, I mean, this can be part of an overall resiliency plan as we continue to deal with other, um, you know, emergencies from climate change, for example. So having a plan of flexible work, um, on-site, off-site plan is good. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to wrap up with um, four basic sets of planning areas. And um, again, Steve has really gotten into the gotten to the details of the specific guidance, um, and we can post that in the chat as well, um, so that people can see the, the very specific practical um, protocols issued by the government. Um, there's four areas of planning. Um, one is uh, population management. So again, encouraging to develop a work plan. May 20th is 50% capacity, but think about, you know, who is working offsite, who is on site, what are hours, how are they staggered, keep teams or pods, you know, within the overall op office population segregated. Um, <clears throat> the other part is administrative and um, communication is really important. Um, both for safety, but also for employee confidence. Um, engineering measures, and Steve mentioned some of these include ventilation, um, air quality, um, deep and frequent cleaning, uh, respacing furniture, reducing clutter, providing wash stations, and uh, green cleaning supplies. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is also we don't want to create um, issues with chemical sensitivities. And I think the, the governor's um, guidance acknowledges this too and has a link to um, OSHA recommendations for um, sort of non-toxic cleaning products. Um, and finally, provide uh, personal um, protection, so masks, um, 
you know, again, sanitizers um, for all the employees. Um, so, Steve, I think with that, I will um, turn it over, turn it back to you. And again, the, all, you know, the specific recommendations are, are very clear in the guidance document. Um, so that, that is very helpful. Um, and we'll post that. All right, Aisha, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, just to let people know, I've been monitoring the questions in the chat box and a number of you have asked, first off, just we will again be going through the questions at the end of the webinar, but also to the questions you've been raising, they're good points about, well, my workers went home to work from home, but if they come back to my site, we didn't technically close the business, but we closed the physical site. Conceptually, I would think that you'd still have to perform the protocol to make your physical site, to reopen your physical site. Your business has remained open, but your physical site was closed. Therefore, you'd have to do some of the things that the state and Aisha was just mentioning in terms of your physical site. But those would be the kind of things that we will work on getting you answers for either during this webinar or subsequently. Having said that, I'd like to now pivot to our, our three excellent panelists who have a wealth of experience and knowledge to share. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Vigilante. Chris works for Northside Development. They own a number of buildings in New Haven and throughout the region, perhaps most prominently 195 Church Street, but there are certainly others. Um, Chris has been in the industry now for many years. Chris, uh, we set you up with a couple of um, potential questions, but why don't you take those away or talk about whatever you and your a business are thinking about with the properties that you manage and the tenants you deal with. Chris? Sure. So um, we had, when this whole thing um, started back in March, we had many essential companies that needed to have access to their office space. So uh, a lot of the protocols that uh, are being instituted now, uh, we, we started back in March and um, it was important uh, for certain uh, companies to, to gain access. So we, the guidelines that the state of Connecticut uh, sent out to us that we think are fabulous. Um, uh, we think that um, the office managers, we've sent them out to all the office managers of every single tenant in our building. Uh, in addition to those guidelines, we've also set up our own building guidelines uh, as well, which are a little more stringent than uh, some of the uh, suggestions uh, the state of Connecticut um, came up with. So um, I'm just going to run through what we what we're doing or planning on doing or in the process of doing. So back in March, uh, we hired full time personnel to just be high touch point um, day porters, basically walking around with disinfectant and hitting all doors, handles, elevator buttons, handrails. Um, of all the common areas, all the bathrooms to ensure that, uh, and we just we rotated through the building uh, eight hours a day during, during the working hours. Uh, additionally, uh, after hours at night, we, we do a complete disinfectant of all common areas as well too on a daily, on a nightly basis. Um, we are instituting as of the uh, Reopen Connecticut Day of May 20th, potentially a day or two earlier, we're going to add a second uh, or additional personnel, I should say, to now expand those um, disinfectant um, areas on a more frequent basis and also expand it to um, where our restrooms will get cleaned uh, at least twice a day, again, from 8 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and then they'll be completely disinfected at night. Um, we're in the process of adding hand sanitizer stations. It's been very difficult to get. Um, we've ordered 20 of them, uh, one for every floor outside the elevator, um, in every single common elevator, and in the lobby as well, too. So they should be within in our hands in about two weeks. Um, we're in the process of upgrading our, our HVAC system. We are going to a hospital-grade filtration system throughout the building. Um, and we, in addition to that, we're forcing uh, more 
fresh air into the building on a, on a, on a regular basis. We're, we're letting stagnant air apparently is a, is not a, is not a good thing. So um, we are having our fan rooms run almost 24 seven to keep air moving and bring constant fresh air into the building. Um, simple things like we are not letting uh, contractors such as UPS and FedEx to roam throughout the building delivering packages. Uh, we've limited that to coming into the lobby, uh, setting up a station where UPS, FedEx, et cetera, drops off their packages and tenants would come down and pick them up. Um, we, uh, we have a, a great conference room. I think Steve and Mike have been in, in our conference room, our conference facility that will remain closed until we get guidance from uh, the governor or state of Connecticut that social gatherings of more than five people can happen. Um, we, uh, we reiterated some of the um, guidelines by, by the state of Connecticut and define them a bit more so that, you know, the state of Connecticut talks about social distancing and capacity of elevators. So we've, we've asked um, and posted signage uh, as of yesterday, actually, um, to limit occupancy of all elevators to two persons per car. Um, any building contractors that are working throughout the building, doing construction, et cetera, they cannot ride with any tenants. They have to stay in there. Um, freight elevators only. Um, we're asking all guests, obviously, and tenants to wear masks when they're coming through the common areas. Um, we're asking guests and uh, tenants to ask, you know, to limit guests and vis visitors to an absolute minimum. Um, and we're s installing signage throughout the lobby just to remind people uh, of, of the social distancing rules, the elevator um, guidelines, and the mask guidelines. And the mask guidelines are really we're stating it's no exceptions, at least in the common areas. You know, the, uh, the Connecticut state guidelines, I think, are, are very clear in the fact that <clears throat> building owners are responsible for common areas and um, signage, social distancing, where, where they can control it. But a lot of this, these guidelines really fall upon the tenant office managers or tenant COOs or whoever runs the office to really, you know, have their employees um, you know, change and, and, and really follow these guidelines. And we, we think that's, you know, some of the suggestions are fabulous. We talked about separating desks, 50% capacity, staggered oncoming times. Um, so we, we do try to facilitate, uh, our tenant needs as best we can. Um, what else? Chris, I'm oh. going to, I'm going to cut in if I can on you there, just yeah. because I'd like to get to the other two and then we can cycle sure. back for anything in the Q and yeah. A. I got one more thing. All right. We're one also, more then, then please go ahead. We're also, we're also providing free toilet paper to tenants to take home in case they can't buy anything in the stores. So there Wonderful. You go. <laughs> Obviously, it's not. It's no longer in the news as much as it was a month or so ago. But thank you. That sure it's well. You got it. It's well appreciated. Um, sure. Darlene Riley is our next panelist. Uh, she works for the Hurley Group. Uh, the Hurley Group owns and manages several buildings throughout New Haven, including most prominently 55 Church Street. But they have properties all over, all different kinds of properties. So Darlene, I think you've just unmuted yourself. So why don't you please go ahead and uh, have the floor? Well, thank you, Steve. Thanks to you and Aisha for including me in this panel discussion. Um, these are very important topics that we're all discussing and I'm honored to be included. So um, as Chris mentioned, we are doing many of the same um, you know, implementations of sanitizing, disinfecting, social distancing, following all these guidelines as well in our building um, in preparation for reopening. Um, but in focusing on our small to mid-size office tenants, we're seeing that most plan to continue from, to work from home and only have minimal staffing returning maybe in June or even later. Um, their plans include staggering their staff throughout the summer 
and that would allow adherence to the 50% capacity, the distancing guidelines, and square footage guidelines in the offices so that they didn't have to go through a complete um, you know, redesign of their space, but basically just use distancing and reduce capacity in order to meet those guidelines. Um, most of our tenants also want to take it slow so that they can better understand the implications of reopen and see the development of new or better practices to follow going forward. Um, as far as all of these guidelines and the new requirements that we're all facing, they will all certainly have a big impact on commercial office space. Um, the open offices that we've seen develop over the past few years with, you know, as Aisha mentioned, like best a bench type desking or cluster workspaces and, and huddle space will most likely disappear. In, and have to be replaced with small private offices or workstations that have very high wall dividers in order to maintain proper distancing between employees. Um, this could see a result in a need for additional square footage uh, in order to, to achieve these guidelines and reduce the population density within an office space. Um, this, this work from home experiment that we're all in is also demonstrating that companies may not need as much space going forward. Um, many experts that you know, we are, are following like um, JLL and Cushman Wakefield and, and others in the field are envisioning a transition where workers rotate days in the office with days working from home and that all office space becomes shared reducing the overall footprint that might be needed. Um, you know, this is all new and, you know, who knows what we're gonna see coming out of this. But as of today, we haven't seen a significant increase in available office space, but we do anticipate changes coming up as leases come up for renewal and we reach, you know, post COVID with new information about our office needs. Um, you know, many landlords do anticipate that the office environment is going to change dramatically. And as such, landlords need to be creative, both in adapting space for new uses and in crafting flexible lease terms, you know, in order to move ahead and, and stay successful. Um, you know, at this point, it's all still very new, and we anticipate seeing the ripple effects for quite some time. Um, you know, it, it's just, this is something that we've never, we've never experienced, we've never gone through. So, you know, we're all trying to pivot and do our best and come out of it, you know, better prepared and better educated. Uh, thank you, Darlene, very much. And uh, your, your comments are a perfect segue on design issues because we have on the panel, Eric O'Brien. Eric is the principal, I believe, of Urbane New Haven, which is a very prominent local design firm. He's been involved in projects most notably like the district, but he's also got other things going on around the city and has for a number of years. So Eric, um, when we talk about redesigning spaces, adapting and renovating spaces, uh, what kinds of comments or thoughts do you have? So please, uh, Eric, welcome. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, so, you know, obviously, since the start of this, you know, we've been, you know, buried in it and trying to figure out, like, what's, what's next, um, you know, and, you know, here, at, you know, our offices are here at District, um, you know, we're mainly construction and, uh, you know, so we've been, we've got projects going on, we're listed as essential businesses, so we've been, you know, we've been open um, since this and you know gradually seeing all the changes and started implementing you know all these things that uh, you know are in the governor's guidelines now you know we've been you know we've had an implementation implementation for several several weeks now um and you know it's you know at first it was a challenge people were like well, well we have to wear face masks and this and that and you know but it, 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 people quickly adapted it to it you know and so what we did in our office um you know, on, like on the first day where this started to come down, 
you know, we said, okay, well, our office is laid out like this. How do we create circulation so we're not, you know, we're not crossing each other at, at odd spots and, t and times and someone's walking out of their office and not knowing where someone else is, you know, so we did a very simple thing. We kind of took, we, we took guidance from what the retail supermarkets were doing and creating one, one way zones for uh, hallways. Um, and, you know, we're carrying that through. And so, you know, it works very well in our office. And, you know, so as we're looking at reopening co-work um, for the, to a lot of companies on, on the 20th, um, you know, we've done the same thing, you know, so um, our co-working spaces um, were generally designed for uh, their smaller offices. Um, there's several corridors and hallways. Um, and, you know, so we just kind of created a series of one way streets um, down them. So um, I think that's, that's going to be a big, big help. Our main corridor in the building um, for us um, is very, um, you know, fortuitous is that we designed them very wide, big, big main entry doors. Um, so there's lots of space for tenants to move around um, and keep that social distancing. We took all of our, you know, our corridors are, are they're active corridors in that we have lounge spaces in our corridors. And what we've done is we've created, um, you know, barriers with all of our furniture that was in that space and push, pulled all of our, our furniture to the center to push traffic to the outsides against the walls instead of the, instead of, you know, the opposite, which was, you know, walk through the center of the corridors, furniture is off to the space, off to the edges. So, you know, simple things like that made, you know, really made a big impact on how uh, people can move through the space, still be, you know, still see and interact pe with people, um, but not be right on top of each other. Um, so, you know, that's, that, you know, that's been a big, um, you know, bonus for us. Also with the co-working spaces for us, um, you know, a lot, a lot of co-work um, across the country and across the world have these big wide open um, spaces that, you know, Aisha talked about earlier that, you know, the open, open plan. Well, we found out very early that, you know, there, there's been a gradual shift away from open space um, seating in that people really, really do want to be able to go off into their own space, hunker down, get their work done, and then come out and engage with people in, in short periods of time, but for the most part, be in their office. So we designed our space spaces to have more of those, you know, small offices. Um, and, and I think that that's going to be a benefit, um, you know, in the long run and what's going on. Now, those offices are designed to fit, you know, many people inside a small office. Um, that's kind of been the trend. That's going to change. People are going, people are going to start to start reducing the number of people that they put in these small offices. And we've seen that already. We've seen, a, you know, we've seen a push from, um, you know, uh, members of the co-work, you know, asking to take another space so they can split up their employees. Um, we've also, you know, you know, we've been in constant conver conversation with all of our members. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the feedback is, you know, working from home does work, but they're dying to get back to interact, but they're going to come back at, at a different, at a, at a different pace and a different rate. And they are going to stagger, you know, there are, there's lots of talks about staggering employees and who comes in for how many hours and what days. Um, but I think the social interaction is very important. Um, you know, and it, from what we've seen, you know, our, our building has been open. There are lots of essential businesses that do um, operate in our building. And, you know, people are very respectful and understanding of, you know, what's going on. Um, and they're, they're, you know, they're starting to really get to, you know, to get used to this new normal. Um, you know, the other nice thing about, you know, our campus is we have a lot of outdoor space. Um, so people can get outside to, you know, and, and socialize, um, you know, going forward, um, you know, we, we believe that, you know, this is, this is obviously a, a serious change in, in, in the way that we're going to be doing business for the near term future, but we don't see it as a permanent thing. Um, we think, you know, this, this is going to be, you know, you know, temporary is, you know, 12 to 18 months of, of, of living like this, I think. And, and then, you know, our hopes and, you know, thoughts are that, you know, we're going to be back to, you know, a relative normal 
Um, maybe not. You know, I think I think the good thing is, you know, I think we'll return to a normalcy that we saw before, but with more awareness um, about um, social contact. Um, so, you know, the challenge in designing spaces for that is, you know, we, we need to make changes today. Um, and but we need to be able to adapt and 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 change. You know um, the days of you know the big days of uh, big meetings and conferences um, are you know just you know they're not going to be in our in our near future. But we can't design a building that doesn't um, you know allow for that in the future. So our spaces need to be much more adaptable. So. Wonderful, Eric. Thank you very much. Let me jump in there because we do have some questions. We have about 10 minutes or actually nine minutes left, believe it or not, on questions. So let me just cover a couple of things. First is we will be able to make available to all attendees. And thank you, by the way, we've, we've doubled the number of people we thought were going to attend this webinar. So welcome and thank you, everybody, for, for staying with us. But we will be able to send out to everybody a recording as well as the one pager that I referred to uh, at the top of the um, webinar. So we will have that to send to people. Um, I want to ask the panelists, and also if we've been joined by Director Maritza Bond of the Health Department, I got a couple of questions I jotted down. The first question, this actually might go to Chris and Darlene, which would be a couple of questions about the responsibilities of landlords vis-a-vis -vis tenants. My impression is that both landlords and tenants have responsibilities that they have to meet to get a building to be safe, not just one or the other. Uh, Chris and then maybe Darlene, do you want to comment on that? And then we'll see if Director Bond wants to add in. Uh, absolutely. It, you know, it's clearly spelled out in um, the Reopen Connecticut office guidelines uh, where the responsibility lines are. Uh, I think that in reality, it's going to be blended a little bit, but it, it really puts um, owners with uh, very specific um, and manages a very, very specific duties. And it also puts the office managers uh, or owners of these uh, companies with very specific procedures. And it's, it's actually laid out very well. I was impressed with the uh, publication that they came out with. Yeah, I echo the sentiments that Chris just shared. And um, Aisha, thank you for sharing the link again so that um, those that are on, can review the link. It's really critical to to know what these guidelines um, um, entail, so that your organizations can be preparing and ensuring the safety of um, who will be um, in you know commuting into these uh, different establishments. So both the employees and anyone that will be entering these these buildings. I, I agree with Chris and with Maritza as well. And I believe that, you know, both landlords and tenants have the responsibility and they have to work together to protect the health and well-being of all of us. So, um, you know, and, and I think, too, a lot of it is mentioned in leases, um, you know, refer back to leases, landlord and tenant responsibilities. Thank you both, uh, actually all three of you. Um, next question I think would be for Director Bond and then for Aisha. A couple of questions about closed versus non-closed. If a facility, a law office or something has sent um, employees to work from home, closed the office to clients, to bring people back to that physical site or facility, do businesses have to self-certify and go through the protocol? Director Bond? Um, so, you know, this is a question that we do not regulate these type of establishments per se because we're not licensing them. Um, what we're doing on the city side is really making sure that we have clear protocols and safety measures in place for the employees that will be coming back. Um, so that's going to be really critical um, as uh, different establishments are, are, are gearing up to have employees um, really do a, um, an OSHA published a nice guideline on how to ensure uh, the safety measures that needs to be considered. And so I really asked the leadership teams within these respective organizations to be to have a safety committee that will be looking at proper protocols with the OSHA guidelines and EPA guidelines that have been published on the national level. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, Aisha? Yeah, just having flexibility, I think, and really understanding um, also, you know, talking to employees and finding out 
um, is it, you know, what's working in terms of working from home versus, um, you know, some people are going to be chomping at the bit to come back and just making sure that there's, uh, you know, balance and flexibility in your planning, but again, adhering to all the safety protocols um, that Dr. Bond was referring to. Great, we've got about time for about two more questions. Um, one thing I think, Aisha, you may have touched on, perhaps you and Director Bond could just quickly say, there was a, is a change of 70 square feet to 110 square feet per person. Is that, was that a comment that somebody made and could they just expand on that? Um, I'm, I'm happy to address that from an architecture perspective. It's really, um, it, if you look at, um, you know, firms that supply office furniture, they've, um, over the past years, it's really, um, there's been a real trend towards a benching system where, um, you know, employees are lined up on either side of a bench table that, that uh, reduces the overall square footage per employee to about 70 um, square feet per employee. Um, once you put somebody in a cube, you know, and maintain that sort of six foot radius or even a, a larger radius, then obviously that increases the footprint for each workstation. So it really has to do with a workstation metric. Okay, and Director Bond, perhaps actually you can touch on this one. Somebody asked about whether or not the city will be promulgating uh, protocols or guidelines with regard to public spaces in the city. It's a little off topic, but just thought you'd be the one to ask about that question. In regards to public uh, uh, spaces, in regards to like parks and beaches and things of that nature? I, th I think that was the question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, you know, we are exploring that with the reopening committee with Michael Piscatelli's team, and we actually were talking about some of the public spaces and how we're going to resume moving forward. So there are conversations with the team about that. Um, and and uh, once we have uh, guidance available, we will certainly communicate that to the public. Great. I think we can squeeze one more question in, um, had to do with bathrooms. Eric, maybe then in Director Bond, you wanna talk a little bit about redesigning bathrooms or how bathrooms might be redesigned or need to be redesigned going forward? Sure. Yeah. Um, you want to take a stab at it? <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, or you can thinking, pass. <laughs> yeah, we're 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 obviously thinking about it. Um, you know the, you know, you know, bathrooms have to have door locks. They have to have you know, like when you have like individual um, stalls, like you know, you've got there's lots of touch points. Um, you know, so yeah. redesigning in the future. You know, do you go with? You know, the thought is, you know, it, it's a trend that we've been we've been pushing. Um, for a while now is, you know, going with, you know, more single use um, bathrooms, um, you know, it's more expensive on the build out, but I think uh, people, uh, people actually really enjoy that. They're smaller, smaller bathrooms. So when you enter it, you're in your own space, you know, you have hand, you know, paper, paper hand towels, you can wash your hands, you can open the door with a paper towel, just you know, having the the, the um, trash can placed right next to it, drop the towel and walk out. And, you know, it, it seems like a, a more comfortable and safer environment. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the thought, you know, we're, we're, you know, also, you know, with the spaces that we have now, you know, touchless soap, touchless, touchless uh, flushers, touch, touchless um, faucets, all that. Um, we've installed um, foot openers um, on the doors to, you know, so you can now, instead of touching the handle, um, on the entrance um, doors, you can you know you step on this little foot grabber, pull the door open, um, walk out. Um, so that's you know kind of the, the little things that we're doing, and you know bigger long range things. I think is a, is, a, is probably going to be shift more to that uh, those individual um, bathroom units. And I think um, for me, from the health, can anyone hear me? Yes, actually, yes. although Director Bond, I've been told we have thirty seconds, so I've got to just ask if really? I can. Go yeah, ahead. so really so really quickly on our sanitarians will be doing that. We will be really inspecting uh, what protocols are in place for bathrooms for certain establishments. So bathrooms really need to be properly stocked with the proper su uh, supplies. We have clear pathways um, for social distancing and proper markings for customers and staff to be able to see what the proper distancing need to be in place. 
cleaning and disinfecting products or disposable wipes should be readily available. There should be a log of how frequently the bathrooms are being cleaned. And of course, to Eric's point, using touchless appliances is the preferred method um, and making sure that this, uh, trash cans are frequently changed as, um, as much as possible. Wonderful. Thank you, Director Bond, and thank you again to our panelists and guests. Thank you to the attendees. This is not the end of the conversation, but the start of it. We will be sending out additional links and resources and information to all of you who attended. Uh, please do feel free to reach out to us, and thank you all very much. Stay safe and healthy, uh, and until next time, take care, all. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.